let me say hello to one of the most remarkable people I've ever had the pleasure of uh, talking with, and I will speak to him in just a moment. He is uh, King Cornelius III of the Khoi people uh, in South Africa, who you can see on video at the top of the homepage, uh, and then there's a story and headlines about it as well. He is the man who is uh, making the new nation of good hope a viable alternative. Talk about hope for persecuted peoples. Uh, Your Majesty, welcome to the program, and thank you so much for being here. Thank you very much for having me. I think what you've done is uh, is absolutely extraordinary, and I don't know if you heard, but I've been covering the situation in South Africa for at least 15 years with the farm murders and the other types of persecution that are reported, and we don't get a full report out of there, but we try. And this is the most brilliant solution to the problem I could have envisioned. I, in fact, I never thought of it. I used to say years ago, Your Majesty, that there should be a section of South Africa set aside for the Afrikaners and others of color who are being discriminated against. That was my proposal 15 years ago. But what you have presented here is stunning. I was just an instrument in God's hands to do what needs to be done for the benefit of the people. Um, we have been crying and begging and praying and trying all avenues, legal avenues, yes. wanting people just to listen, and nobody listened. And then it was revealed by one of my people and says, this is what God wants you to do. And I questioned it, can it be? Is it viable? Is it real? And there were so many affirmations that said that this is what should be done. And the irony of it all is I've been praying over this matter for a very long time. And then one morning in church, the ministers over the altar said, he said, and David said, King David said to Solomon, his son who is younger than him, he says, be of good courage and do not be afraid for God is with you. And that was my message that I needed to do what had to be done to save the people from the plight and the genocide that is happening in our country at the moment. The the uh, alleged government of South Africa could not possibly, and this I'm speaking for myself, not for you, Your Majesty, or anyone else, could not possibly be more evil or corrupt or deadly. Uh, it is something that doesn't belong on this planet. Uh, they can stay there. They can stay in the East. The map is up for all to see at rents.com. You'll see it there the United State of Good Hope. And what a wonderful name. How did you come up with the name for the, the new country, the secession country? How did the name come to you, Good Hope? It never came to me. It was given to me. Um, before, prior to colonialism, the Cape was called the Cape of Good Hope for all sailors passing. Yes. Because the, the suffering they had on the sea, this was the place where they could be relieved place of hope for them to rest and receive food and nourishment on their way forward. And the Cape has always been the gateway to Africa. The Cape, from childhood, we've never been angry people. Mm -hmm. So we've always been hopeful for the way forward and for things to happen to us. I often say to people, you need to understand the land does not belong to me. I belong to the land. And you cannot separate this from the land. Because the land was given as a gift from God to the people that lived here. And everybody that came here was invited. And whether they took, we allowed them to take. <laughs> right. And right. and I think good hope is is a nice is a nice feeling. Because when you say for example, you coming to Cape Town, or you're booking a, a plane ticket from America and you come into Cape Town and saying, I'm going to good hope. What a nice feeling it is having because mm -hmm. if you look at the rest of the world and you see the genocide and the, the evil in the world and you come into a place of good hope, it, it's, it's an attraction. It's a wonderful, a wonderful name, a wonderful feeling. Uh, I see on the map uh, the flag. You have a flag. Uh, it is red and blue with five white stars on it. What do the stars signify? The Southern Cross. Oh, very nice. So, 
they have the Southern Cross. It's, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We've heard so many prophecies that, that all those that believe in God needs a safe haven. And if they, if the good hope is their safe haven, mm-hmm. then so shall it be written, so shall it be done. It seems to be uh, a problem with some of the groups that ought to be running to join this secession, that they are worried about living under a king. How do you foresee your role in the state of good hope, the nation? What is your position going to be? I am only the custodian of the land and the custodian of the people. That is all I am. Mm-hmm. Um, the people must govern themselves. That is the, that is what it is. They must govern themselves. I must just rule the nation. And when I rule the when you say rule the nation, you see that there's no evil done, and that everybody lives in harmony. Mm-hmm. Because this is what it's all about. If I live by godly values of love and kindness and being kind and sharing and doing good. Mm-hmm. And this is what God expects of us. And this is what it, what it was in the beginning. It used to when be it is part, much better, yes. <laughs> it used to be, it is our culture. If I have two slices of bread, I would give one to my brother um, because I'm sharing with kindness. And in today's life, I have two slices of bread. I will cut the one in half and give it to my brother. And I say, I'm sharing, but I'm not sharing with kindness. When the colonials came here, we invited them. We said, come, share with us. Um, Whenever we have a feast, we slaughter a lamb like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, give thanks to God, let the blood flow in the earth. Mm -hmm. And then we share the meat with everybody around us. Mm -hmm. This is part of our culture, part of our nature. This is what is expected of mankind to be. But mankind has drifted so far away from the value systems that it is all about me, myself, and I. And you can see it in South Africa, the, the way we're living now. We have 11 million homeless people in South Africa. Um, the people are standing on street corners begging, and you look at their eyes, and they have no hope, and they have no dignity. That is not what is ex- expected of us to have. So when I, as, as, as the leader, or as the king, that is my responsibility to see that nobody comes short of what is inherently theirs. Everybody has the right to determine their own future, their own destiny, to live the way they see fit for the benefit of themselves and their families and their children. That's wonderfully said, and uh, I hope this message is going to be listened to by all down there. Will Good Hope be open to all who wish to come to it? Who's going to be allowed in? Who will be welcomed who will be not rejected, perhaps, but uh, told, you really don't belong here. You should go back to the other side with the ANC, with whatever. How do you see the mix? That is not up to me to decide. Uh, the people, as like I said earlier, the people will govern. Mm-hmm. And the peace treaty that I had with the Afrikaner, the Eurokaner, and the colored people, and the Khoisan people, those are the people that will come together and decide what is best for the way forward that this nation be a benefit for everybody that needs it. I will just affirm it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Would you call uh, the basic form of government a monarchy with a representative parliament under it? What kind of structure have you in mind, Your Majesty? It will be a federal state. A federal um, state. Right. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Um, this is what has been presented to me. And it looks as the most viable project for the way forward. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I now, am the king. There's, y- there's yes. no question about it. Yes. And this is my responsibility. So, But the people will govern, the people will rule, and the people will decide what is best for them. As it should be. We have uh, a lot of people who listen in South Africa, and they're watching this very carefully. Since you have announced the secession and signed it, what have you heard? What is the sense you're getting in terms of reaction? 
a lot of people are excited, but a lot of people have fear. They fear that there's going to be anarchy. They fear that there's going to be uh, retribution for for being part of this. Yes. But what I've come to understand is that many people have planned something like this for years, and they've never done it. And because I've done it, they feel they are angry because they've been robbed of the opportunity mm-hmm. to have a secession. And I'm saying it's not necessary. It's going to benefit everybody. Come. I, I, I said one day to one of the leaders of the, the Maori people, I said, he asked me, can I come help you? I said, please come help us. Because if your heart is like my heart, come get in my chariot mm-hmm. and come help save the nation. Mm-hmm. And this is what I'm saying to all the, pe- all the people in South Africa, in the new nation. In good hope, if your heart is like my heart, come. Get in the chariot and come help save the people and give them better hope or, or good hope. The next step is to uh, file with the uh, Constitutional Court. Yes, we have people that is um, preparing the documents. The documents have been prepared. Mm-hmm. There's people that is as legal expert, legal, legal knowledge, that will follow all the due processes to make this thing um, a success. And we will follow their lead. Very good. They know how it needs to be done. Your Majesty, your people have suffered for a long, long time. How would you, how would you tell our listeners about the suffering and abuse that the Khoi people have had to sustain? Wow, Jeff, that's... When we, when we think about it, in the very beginning, with the time of colonialism in 1652, when Jaffa and Ribig arrived at the Cape. Yes. In, 1650, in 1659, with the first Khoi Dutch war, Jan van Ribbe became so frustrated because they couldn't kill the Khoi in the war, because they were so fleet-footed and clever, because they only attacked the fort in the rain, so they couldn't light the flint blocks of the firearms. Oh, how clever. And then, and then Jan van Ribbe gave a written order, a written order, that for every Khoi person you kill, you cut off his upper lip and I'll pay you for it. Now, we've seen in, in, in movies about the cowboys and the Indians and how the cowboys used to sculpt the Indians, get paid for the sculpts. Yeah. The same thing happened in Cape Town. The, up, the upper lips was cut off. Now, when you cut off your upper lip, you're being defaced. You're being dehumanized. So how many people's lips wasn't cut off while they were still alive? Um, there was, there's a book written by one of the professors at uh, University of the Western Cape, Skeletons in the Closet, where he says that when the people spoke the language and taught the children the language, when they wouldn't listen, their meat was cut of their bones while they were alive as a lesson to the community to, to listen. And when they died, their bodies was exhumed and the meat was boiled off their bones in the presence of the communities. Good Lord. And then the bones was, their bones were sent to Europe as scientific, scientific studies to see whether we're human. Now, these are just the atrocities that is written in the journals of, of the colonials. Mm-hmm. Um, but many, many things have been happening. We have been betrayed by so many people so many times because we trust. We are, that is our part of our culture is to trust. And when we, when we went during the apartheid, firstly we had um, colonialism. Then we had Afrikanerdom. Mm-hmm. Then we had apartheid. Mm-hmm. Now we're supposed to have democracy. And through all that time periods and phases in our lives, we have been dehumanized. We've not been recognized. We've, we are, d- during the apartheid years, we were the buffer between the white and the black. We got a little bit of privileges. And that is why in 1976, we stood up and said, let us get equal education first. Mm-hmm. And in the Western Cape or the Cape, the Cape province at the time, Education was for us the most important thing. And we felt deprived that we never had the same education as the white people had. The black people then took that and said, no, we needed to abolish Afrikaans. And they wanted their freedom. And in 1994, when we made our first cross for democracy, Mm -hmm. we believed we were free. We believed that. We were excited about it. And in 1997, 1995, when the United Nations discovered that the Khoi and the Bushmen or the Aboriginal people are still alive in South Africa. They informed the government that you need to acknowledge the Aboriginal people. In 1997, our government started making 
promises and plans. And in 1999, they changed the coat of arms in our country, saying, let us acknowledge the Aboriginal people. And we were excited because our language were there and our figurines were there. Mm -hmm. And they invited us to be part of the drafting of the white paper to include us into the house of traditional leaders that Nelson Mandela had started in 1994. And we were so excited because now for the first time, for the first time in our lives, we are going to be acknowledged and recognized as people. Because before that, we were not recognized as people. And in 2003, when that white paper became an act, oh, I went forward, I said, now, where do we sit? And they said to me, sorry, it's not for you. It's only for the black people. They said, but, but don't worry, you can benefit from the act if you have an association with a black monarch. And immediately I went up into the Eastern Cape to King Zandila of the Chachabi Kingdom because when the Tozas came over the Kai River for the, for the very first time, they met my great-great-grandfather and they signed a peace treaty with him. Uh -huh. So I went to King Zandila. I says, when I came there, he says, we know this land is yours. I said, I didn't come for the land. I come to re-sign a peace treaty that your great-grandfather had signed with my great-grandfather and immediately he signed it. And then they had a royal feast in the same crowd where the first peace treaty was signed hmm. to, to have a blood covenant with what is happening now. Because we believe that if we have an association with a black monarch, we're going to benefit from the act. And I came back to the governor and says, now I fulfilled all the requirements of the act. And he says, well, the act is now repealed. But we are going to draft, draft a new act to include the Khoi people or the Khoisan people into the House of Traditional Leaders. And every year they promise they're going to do it and they're not doing it. And my people are hoping and waiting. And in 2007, when the United Nations passed the Declaration for the Rights of Indigenous People, oh, we were excited. And I went for that. I said, now you have to listen. You, you signed a Declaration for the Rights of Indigenous People with 143 other countries throughout the whole world. And they said to me, you need to understand that South Africa, there's no law in South Africa that says your people. So international law cannot be applied to you. So I'd our people are sitting and wait, are waiting and saying, now, yeah. again, again. And every time we go and approach them and says, oh, we're busy with the, the drafting of, 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 of a traditional leaders act to include the Khoisan people. Mm -hmm. And they're busy with the act and says that the Khoisan people will be lesser people than the black people in South Africa. And we say, but hang on, we are the aboriginal people. Not We are the original people of the land. We are the first nation indigenous. Mm -hmm. Oh, but you need to understand that the black people are also indigenous. I said, I said yes, they are. They are indigenous to Africa. But the Khoi and the Bushmen are the first nation people of Southern Africa. So fr from, the, from the time that we can remember and from all the stories that I've been told and spoke, told, being the firstborn son for 16 generations, these stories have come down from generation to generation of the genocide and the atrocities that has happened to our people. Um, and even up until today, nobody listens to us because we're not classified or even recognized as people in the land of our ancestors. So all these atrocities, there's a, a grandmother over the mountain from where I live and one morning, she's making a big pot of maize meal. And she's crying. And I says, now, Granny, why are you crying? And she says, ah, oh, my child, um, there won't be enough food for all the children tonight. And I have no cash on me. And she goes into the back room, and she comes back with a newspaper. And she tears it up, and she throws it into the pot, and she stirs it, and it becomes black from the ink. And she's smiling. I says, Granny, now, why are you smiling? She says, I am my child. All the children will be able to eat tonight. Oh my. And then I realized that my children are eating maize meal and newspapers for supper. And then I understood that when you start listening to the people on the ground, we, we, a wise man said one, one day to me, he says, we need to start listening. Because when we listen, we can hear what the people have to say. And when we hear what the people have to say, we know what they're talking about. And when we know what they're talking about, we, we can understand how they feel. And only when we understand how they feel, we can make wise decisions. And by listening to all the people along the coast uh, that we have here, uh, the weather was bad one day and they phoned me and they says, um, we had to kill the neighbor's dog to feed the children. And I became very angry and the elders said to me, it's okay. 
The children ate, and half of the dog is still in the fridge for tomorrow. They say, but what about the boy that lost his pet? And we don't realize the consequences and, and the, the ripple effect of things that is happening to our people and how they've lost the hope for a better life for themselves. To de- just to determine how to go forward and, and make decisions for themselves. So in, 20, in 2010, I, I went to the Human Rights Commission in South Africa and I said, the president is not listening to me, even though he made promises in 2008 before he became president. And they said to me, we need to understand that the Human Rights Commission in South Africa have no authority over international human rights. We only deal with human rights in South African human rights law. And I went to the public protector who was supposed to be the government watchdog. And I said to him, this is what is happening. And they said, well, you need to speak to the minister. I said, I need to speak to the president. And nobody would listen. And then I went to the high court and I got a case number. I charging the president of South Africa, Jacob Zuma, for cultural genocide. And I was excited about it. And there was news all over. And the people were excited because now somebody, the, the legal system is going to put us in place where we're supposed to be. And we got a benefactor and we had advocates and senior counsel. And the matter befe- appeared before the, the judge in the high court. And I was offered by government lawyers 44 million rand as an out-of-court settlement. And I said to them, how can I accept 44 million dan and divide it amongst 4 million people? I said, no, the matter needs to go forward. Unfortunately, our benefactor had government contracts, and he had lost all his government contracts, so we couldn't pay the advocates and the lawyers. So the matter's off the road. So they stopped us on every turn mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. to give us the opportunity to determine our right to self-determination. And this is what is so sad about it. Your Majesty, it it is time to restore good hope to your people. You have suffered long enough. Uh, I am absolutely convinced that there are ears listening tonight who are rallying right now to the concept of secession as you have presented it. I would like to ask uh, Karen if she has a question for you. Good evening, my king. Hello, Karen. How are you? I'm good, thank you. And in fact, it's good morning for you. It's so yes. strange to me to think that you're, you and Mel are starting your day and I'm about to go to bed. It just is very strange to me. Um, we are so very proud of you, King Cornelius for your courage and determination to make South Africa a better place and for the fact that you have stood up for all dispossessed people, dispossessed minorities in that country. Um, It it is very hard, I think, to make a former enemy a friend and to stand up on his behalf. So I salute you for that. Um, I know that you believe that you are only custodian of the land and that it is your God-given duty to make it better for all peoples. But I still salute you for holding your hand out to everybody and saying, stand with me and I, together we can make the world a better place. Um, King Cornelius, for the last couple of days, well, since yesterday when we announced this thing, it was so funny when we were live streaming, our website was under attack the entire time. Mm-hmm. My personal internet was going up and down, up and down. Obviously, someone did not want the world to see this. Mm-hmm. However, we did it, and we've put it out there. Um, we have seen very mixed reactions, and I wonder if you have seen the same thing. Yes, I have. I have, and it's, it's strange but sa- and sad that people cannot see and understand that what was done was for the benefit of everybody. I, on, on Thursday, when, when we signed the treaty amongst the four nations, the white, the Afrikaner, and the Eurokaner, and the Koya, and, and the colored nations, and I came home and my wife said to me, she says, do you understand what you really did today? I said, yeah. She says, no, no, you understand that you had firstly appeased your ancestors. Because of all the atrocities that have happened from the time, from the beginning, you have appeased them and said, is this okay? 
you forgave them. It's all about forgiveness. And this is but bigger than that. You've also appeased the white ancestors and the colored ancestors. You've told them, it's okay, we forgive you for what you did in the past. And then I realized what was really done is that we cancel out our anger by forgiving. And later on, I realized that I had now, when I signed the peace treaty with the the Koza king, I had appeased my ancestors on that side and the black ancestors. So now we can start to have peace because we have shown our ancestors that we have the opportunity and the ability to work together in harmony for the way forward, that they no, they no longer need to be killing. They no longer need to be genocide in this new country of good hope. But the people in the country are so apprehensive and saying, um, is it going to be for himself? Does he want money? Does he want power? And I'm saying, I am just rectifying the injustices of the present so that everybody can live in harmony that is entitled to be here. You know, I think many people, uh, Your Majesty, are questioning this because they have been lied to and betrayed so often for so many years now. It's, It's almost too good to be true. I think we need to give them a little bit of time. Anyone listening to you speak will come away with a good feeling. No question about it. Uh, Mel Vey is also here. Mel, would you like to uh, ask a question of King Cornelius? Yes, thank you, Jeff. Uh, hello, my King. Good to speak to you again. Good morning, Mel. How are you? Very well, thank you. It's about the same time for me as it is for you. And uh, I just wanted to say well done and thank you very much for uh, following through on your plans. I know when you last spoke, you were very secretive about it. Um, I suppose the question that's been coming through from a lot of people is they they want to know how this is going to play out, how international law is going to be applied, and uh, are there any chances that the ANC government will boycott this application? Well, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm trying to find out by my legal advisors what is the, the best way we can go forward to rectify all this. If you would be kind enough to, to tell us what you expect to happen. I know this is an almost Im- impossible situation to analyze, but having dealt with the ANC and the regime in South Africa before and having been ab- abused and insulted and pushed away so many times, what do you expect realistically from that government? What are they going to do? Just ignore this? I don't see how they can, but what do you think their tactics will be? Peaceful. That's the first thing we're going to be hoping for, that it's peaceful, that nobody gets hurt, there's no bloodshed. That's the most important thing. Um, we hope they come and sit and talk to us. That's the first thing we hope for them to talk to us, because they've refused to speak to me for the past 18 years that we've been fighting for this, for our supposed freedom. And we hope people with, with expertise and knowledge come forward and come assist us so that we can put everything in place so when government comes to speak to us, and we hope they do, that we can present to them a full package of of this and that nobody will be deprived of their right Right. in the... This is almost antithetical to the way the regime thinks and acts to the best of my ability to understand it. I understand your optimism and I hope it pans out. But I am uh, certainly with you 100% in in concern about danger and violence. That's what this regime is known for, and you are not. You are the antithesis of that. Absolutely. We we live I, – I have a staff I walk around with every day. I've been walking with a kitty since I was 13 years old. And I have beads on my, on my staff, and it's a red bead and a white bead and a gold bead. And, oh. and this is – How I live, the red is the love and vibrance I have in my heart to share. And the white is the peace that I offer you. And the gold is the truth that I speak. So by living by these values, I speak with love. And then I will not harm them because I have peace in my heart. And when I speak, it's these values will pass on to whoever's going to come approach us, knowing that what we want to do is speak the truth for the best for the people in the new good hope. 
Absolutely. It was matter that God softened their heart, that God softened their hearts, and that they can see that our intent is only honorable and good for the benefit of the people. Right. I think, uh, without question, Your Majesty, you've made that abundantly clear tonight. And as people listen to this program, I think that they will understand there is nothing to fear, and there is only optimism and good hope. And that's what I, I hope people take away from this. We're going to let you go, Your Majesty. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, you're a very busy man. We hope to talk to you again as things continue to develop. And I congratulate you on behalf of free peoples the world over for being as brave as you are and as courageous as you are. Thank you, sir, very much. Thank you, and have a blessed day further. Thank you. Bye-bye.